to a healthy environment. Okay, thanks for the message. Um, but before we start, I should acknowledge that um, most of us, I guess, are, are on the lands of the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of this region. So I want to pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. And uh, I want to acknowledge that um, despite their dispossession from this land, they still have a con continuing connection to the land here and uh, we value their contribution to our local culture and we um, really appreciate their connection to country in our area and we could learn a lot more from them. Um, so I'm, I'm just here to open, uh, Kirsten's going to be running most of the meeting and, and um, our executive director, Helen Oakey, will be here shortly too. So um, the Con Council will be well, well represented. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting topic and perhaps I've been doing this too long, but it, it just seems such an obvious thing. Like, why wouldn't we have rights to a healthy environment? I mean, we, um, we need air to breathe, we need water to drink. I mean, you know, we're, it's absolutely essential for everybody to have a healthy environment. And I, I guess the issue is that uh, our current access to these things is, is uh, quite unequal and, and perhaps that's one of the things that will come up tonight, that we have very unequal access to a healthy environment. Some of us um, get a healthy environment by relying on other people um, having to suffer for the, the sort of goods and services and, and clean environment we might have in our own area. So it's a, it's a very interesting topic, but I, you don't want to listen to me. We've obviously got four very knowledgeable speakers, so I might pass it over to Kirsten now, and um, she will introduce the, the speakers and, and get things going. Thanks, Gordon. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping to start. Please remain on mute um, throughout the speakers' presentations. When we get to the Q&A section, um, uh, if you've got a question, please use the raise hand button um, or and I can come to you or um, put your question in the chat bar. If you could put the word question in front of it, that makes it really clear that it's something that you want to ask the speakers rather than just general conversation. Um, we, we're expecting a, a reasonable number of participants. So if your connection gets a bit slow, maybe just try turning off your video um, and that might improve your feed. All right, so as Gordon said, our topic tonight is the human right to a healthy environment. And the purpose of this event is to discuss the emerging concept of a human right to a healthy environment in law and outline how this can be practically implemented in the ACT through the phase out of fossil fuels, the implementation of renewable energy technologies and other measures uh, that the um, speakers will, will discuss with us. Additionally, we'll discuss the equity outcomes, as Gordon also alluded to, of such innovation and how that will achieve other human rights objectives. As we know, policy frequently has co-benefits and if we can maximise those co-benefits, then um, we've got much better chance of getting that policy impl into implementation as well. So we're gonna hear from four presenters tonight with different perspectives. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Helen Watchers, who is uh, the current uh, Commissioner for Human Rights and also President of the Human Rights Commission in the ACT. Our second speaker will be Annika Reynolds from Green Law, Peter Bulling also from Green Law, and uh, Melly, sorry, Melanie Montalban from the Environmental Defenders Office. So to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Helen Watches OAM. Helen has had a long career as a human rights lawyer, starting out in the Australian Law Reform Commission in 1982. With several years under her belt in the Attorney General's Department of, human, of the Human Rights Branch. Helen has national and international expertise in health and human rights issues, having worked for several UN agencies, including UNAIDS, World Health, Org sorry, World Health Organization and the International Labor Organization. And she's also completed a PhD and a master's degree in HIV AIDS legal issues at the ANU. Helen was appointed as the ACT Human Rights Commissioner, formerly the Discrimination Commissioner, in 2004 and was appointed as Commission President in 2016 with the responsibility to promote the human rights and welfare of all people living in the ACT. 
Helen has served on a number of health and legal advisory and research councils over her career and in 2010 was awarded the Order of Australia Medal for Services to Human Rights in the ACP. So we're absolutely delighted to have the Commissioner here this evening to open our discussion about the human right to a healthy environment. Helen, over to you. Thanks so much, Kirsten. Yuma everyone, which is hello in Ngunnawal. I also would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of land on which we meet, and I respect their continuing culture, the oldest in the world at 60 to 65,000 years old. This culture is protected under Section 27.2 of the Human Rights Act, and it uses wording from the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I'd also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending tonight's event. The ACT took the words of UN human rights treaties and made them enforceable under ACT law in 2004 with the Human Rights Act. Victoria followed in 2006 and Queensland in 2019. I like to call this bringing international human rights law home at the domestic level. We don't have a federal human rights act and we are reliant on territory and uh, state legislation for domestic implementation. I think there has been a complacency about human rights in Australia. Uh, hopefully COVID has shaken this a bit. Uh, people have been restricted to unprecedented levels by the executive, such as freedom of movement from leaving our homes, freedom of assembly, to see our friends and families and privacy of our health um, and personal information and even mandatory vaccinations uh, for certain uh, workforces. Under the 10th ACT Legislative Assembly Parliamentary uh, Governing Agreement between the ALP and Greens, under Appendix 2.17 uh, of the Agreed Legislative Reform, is a um, commitment to consider introducing the right to a healthy environment into the Human Rights Act. It's not strong, the use of the word considers quite weak, and there's also a generic clause about subject to drafting capacity cabinet agreement to the bill and budget funding. Um, however, you look at the whole context, it's actually strengthened because it's in the context of the climate change emergency and commitment to rapid science-based action to mitigate and adapt to climate change and transition the ACT to net zero emissions. Environmental rights were explicitly referred to in the first year's review of the Human Rights Act in 2005. That was a Greens amendment. And uh, we held a forum uh, back on International Human Rights Day 10 December 2005 and debated those exact issues. Didn't get up, but uh, uh, there were ICCPR related uh, amendments, that's the International Covenant Civil and Political Rights. Environmental rights were further considered uh, in 2010 due to the five year review of the Act and the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Project conducted at the ANU and there was a background paper prepared by Gabrielle McKinnon back in June 2010 on implement implications for the environment, energy and water. Uh, but ultimately the government only implemented the uh, economic right of education in uh, 2013 and work in uh, 2020 by backbencher Beck Cody. As I said earlier, uh, there are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural rights explicitly acknowledged in Section 27.2, and that was introduced in uh, 2016. I think in 2021, Australians have been more galvanised into action following uh, COP26 in Glasgow and being ranked 58th of 64 countries in climate change performance um, index. So maybe the timing is really good uh, to move this parliamentary agreement um, commitment along. The right to a healthy environment is still relatively new and its content and its scope are emerging in uh, international and uh, regional human rights bodies like the European Court of Human Rights and they usually fit into civil and political rights like life, liberty, privacy and family home. And uh, there's also the economic and social cultural right of health, which particularly refers to the underlying environmental determinants of health. So there's really a two-way relationship. Human rights um, implementation protects the right to the environment and breaches of the right of environmental rights impact on human rights. So it's a two-way street. You'd all be excited by the resolution this year in October of the UN Human Rights Council. That's the political body, not the treaty body that um, has individual complaints. They're called communications, um, of which there is at least one at the moment against Australia. Uh, 
So it has 47 members, and for the first time, it recognised that a clean, healthy and sustainable environment is a human right. It was proposed by Costa Rica, Maldives, Morocco, Slovenia and Switzerland, and not unexpectedly abstentions, um, but abstentions a lot better than opposing, from uh, India, Russia, China and Japan. That means uh, it's not a standalone right in international law yet. It has to be endorsed by the UN General Assembly um, to have that wider and uh, more powerful implementation. But it's really important in recognising that the role of a healthy environment promotes other rights, like the right to life, health, uh, standards of living uh, and cultural life, to receive and impart information, to participate in public affairs and having uh, effective remedies and the equal protection, particularly in vulnerable groups such as Indigenous peoples. It's been quite a long journey. Um, one of the earliest um, recognition was the Stockholm Declaration in 1972 that uh, introduced a basic framework for environmental rights and there's a declaration and action plan that has uh, 26 broad principles. 20 years later, the Rio Declaration 1992 um, similarly uh, is like the, the genesis of uh, environmental rights now. And that led in 2012 to a UN Human Rights Council having an independent expert on human rights and environment, John Knox. And in 2014, he set out a mapping report uh, that looked at procedural substantive and uh, other obligations across all the core human rights treaties, not just civil and political, economic, social and cultural, but also racial discrimination, UN General Assembly resolutions and other bodies, uh, particularly uh, regional ones. In 2018, he uh, set out a, a framework principles uh, that really um, show a developing substantive content of the right to a healthy environment. There are 155 states that have a healthy environment, either in uh, national constitution, legislations or policies. Australia is not one of them, unfortunately. A good example is the Banjul Charter in Africa. Um, there was a case in 2005 against Nigeria um, in the Supreme Court where uh, they found that Shell breached the rights to life and health by gas flaring in collecting oil and uh, the right to environment and express right under the Banjul Charter meant a right to clean, poison-free, pollution-free, healthy environment. So that's a great precedent, but that's for the um, countries that have that express um, provision. I understand there are about 33 cases internationally, uh, according to the Sarban Centre, with climate cases. Uh, an interesting one closer to home in 2019, the UN Human Rights Committee, that's the treaty body that gets communications and complaints, had one from the Te Tota family from Kiribati. Uh, they applied for refugee status in New Zealand but were deported. And the uh, committee found that the non refoulement obligations of the Refugee Convention could apply to the right to life under the ICCPR. In that case, it wasn't met because the uh, rising th sea levels um, were still a way off and they thought that there'd been protective action taken by Kiribati and the international uh, community. But we are expecting th that right to be more imminently affected in 10 to 15 years. Another case you might be aware of is uh, Urgenda in the Netherlands in 2019, where it found that the insufficient action to address climate change in this low-lying country uh, showed that there was irreversible damages uh, to loss of life and disruption of family life, and there was an express duty on state parties to do something about that. So that could be um, implied to apply to other governments um, because that is a precedent in Europe by that Supreme Court. But closer to home is the 2019 complaint uh, by eight Torres Strait Islanders to the UN Human Rights Committee about uh, the impact of eroding beaches and king tides uh, in relation to spiritually important animals like the turtles, sacred places such as um, uh, cemetery islands uh, where the remains of elders are, are um, placed. And uh, that is currently being considered by the Human Rights Council. It has been assisted by the former um, John Knox, Special Rapporteur, and the current one, uh, Professor David 
barred from uh, the UN. Uh, they've filed a joint amicus brief in support of that claim by the eight Torres Strait Islanders. So that's something to watch with interest. Because the right to a healthy environment is not expressly protected at international law, we've got what we call is greening um, human rights by particularly the right to health. So the right to a, a healthy environment is a necessary precondition um, for rights such as life, liberty, security of the person, home and privacy. But they don't exist in isolation. They are all interrelated, inter indivisible and interdependent. And that was made clear by the Vienna Conference on Human Rights back in 1994 and even the UN Declaration in 48. So it's really important to... Um, Respect, protect, and fulfil these rights. Respect is refrain from interfering. Protect is to prevent third parties from interfering. And fulfil is to actually take positive action, which seems to be lacking in Australia for uh, environmental determinants of health like clean air, safe drinking water, safe and uh, shelter and environmental um, conditions. Queensland has an express right to health. It's quite limited because it's... Um, just protects the right to access to health services without discrimination and not to be denied emergency medical treatment. I think it would be great if the ACT had a broader right to health to include reasonable access to health care and the underlying determinants necessary for good health, which would include environmental rights. The parliamentary and governing agreement doesn't have a time frame or process. Um, so to mean, that means it's open for civil society to do things like perhaps um, sponsor a, a petition to the Legislative Assembly. You need 500 signatures. There's a good precedent of um, a petition that closed last week called No Rights Without Remedy that civil society put in to amend the Human Rights Act to include a complaint mechanism similar to the Discrimination Act. And we've got a forum on the 10th of uh, December online at lunchtime called The Time Is Right. Um, because Supreme Court litigation is inaccessible. It takes a lot of uh, time and stress as well as money to um, participate in uh, test cases. And uh, I think actually reducing dependence on lawyers is actually empowering uh, vulnerable people and you can have a conciliation like we do in um, discrimination matters that are tailored to the circumstances and to have a quick win. Uh, I think. Uh, the Minister for Human Rights and the Minister for Environment, Rebecca Vazirati, would be interested in that. So that would be one way uh, to get things moving before the next election in less than three years. It does take probably, I'd say, two years to get a legislative bid up. So we need to be moving uh, very soon to do that. Lastly, I'd just like to thank Kevin Campbell for helping with, with um, uh, research on the international jurisprudence on the right to a healthy environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. That's um, a really great uh, setting of the scene for us um, and giving us that broad context. Um, I'd now like to introduce Annika. You're frozen. Okay, that's all right. I think everybody back on mute. Yes, all right. Sorry, Annika. In advocating for an inclusive vision of climate justice. They found law of the environment and human rights subcommittee of Australian Lawyers for Human Rights. Annika is a current Laws Honours International Security Studies student at the Australian National University with a minor in Korean. They are a published researcher on public interest environmental litigation, the environment and human rights and climate change topics. I'd like to invite Annika now to uh, outline the applicability of the human right to a healthy environment to the ACT and um, maybe give us some insight into some reform opportunities in the ACT as Helen has just given us a lead into. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Um, so, Basically, what I'm going to be talking about today is taking 
Helen's fantastic introduction to the, the legal international framework that we're working with here and talking about, well, what does that mean in the ACT going forwards and why should all of us tonight who are on this call who don't have degrees in law, who aren't sitting in a lawyer's office day in and day out, why do we care? You know, Helen talking about bringing rights home and the idea that Australia doesn't have a very strong human rights discussion or, or kind of sense of things, I think is, is a really important point for all of us to reflect on. Um, that's a failing of our legal system and the way that we talk about human rights from a legal perspective, absolutely. And so what I want to start with is, um, as Helen outlines, the right to a healthy environment is kind of its own standalone right, but it also underpins pretty much every other human right. It's a really broad right and its content is still developing. Um, so, and I think it really reflects the fact that we're all ecologically embedded beings. You know, we are a part of nature. We breathe in the air, we drink the water. Um, when we're allowed out for what was our one hour COVID walk, we go out in nature and we connect. Um, there's, you know, I could go on. All of the scientific evidence about how having a plant nearby makes us feel better and is good for our physical and mental health. Um, and so it, it's an incredibly broad right, and it's not just a negative right. It's not just freedom from environmental harms. It's also about promoting an, a, a safer, cleaner, healthier environment that we can all actively enjoy and flourish in. And so what I want everyone to do on this call right now, um, and perhaps, you know, put it in the chat. I, I won't ask anyone to come off mute. Please don't come off mute. Um, but perhaps put it in the chat. Reflect on why the right to a healthy environment matters to you. So for me, the right to a healthy environment means the protection and conservation of our iconic places and indigenous heritage for the benefit of all future generations. For my partner, who is a disability advocate in the ACT, um, you know, she gave me a little note earlier that says that the right to a healthy environment means to her accessible and safe nature reserves so that everyone can enjoy the outdoors. So I just want everyone to reflect for a moment. What does a safe, healthy environment mean to you? Like one thing in the ACT, in your daily life, how does a, the environment make your life better? Or how does a safe environment make your life better? Um, so put that in the chat as I kind of take us through is the right protected under ACT law? Um, because Helen's noted really well that the, the legal status of the right to a healthy environment is a little bit contested. We're still developing it. Um, but there is a weasel way to kind of get some of the content of the right to a healthy environment protected in ACT law. So the ACT is one of three jurisdictions in Australia that has a Human Rights Act, and it's only because we have a Human Rights Act that we can do this. So if we were in New South Wales, I'd be saying no. There's, there's no way that any kind of right to a healthy environment is going to be protected under our domestic laws. Um, so we have a Human Rights Act. And under Section 9 of that Act, the right to life is protected. Um, but what does that mean? Um, we know from Section 31 of the Human Rights Act that the courts and other government actors are going to interpret the Human Rights Act and the rights that are protected under it in light of international law. Um, and so we now have this excellent pronouncement from the Human Rights Council. We have international jurisprudence that talks about the right to a healthy environment and how it impacts um, the right to life. I think the strongest pronouncement of that is actually in general comment number 36 of the Human Rights Council, which says quite clearly in one of the paragraphs that climate change negatively impacts the right to life and dignity. And so in essence, if we were to go to the courts, um, in the ACT Supreme Court, you could put an argument forward that your right to life is being impacted by an unsafe, um, degraded environment. Um, and that hasn't been put before the court yet. We don't know if it will be accepted. But there's an argument there that there is some kind of um, a limited right to the healthy environment, um, potentially under ACT law. The bigger question is, is this good enough? And I think we can all agree on this call that, that it's not. A really limited, some components of the right to a healthy environment that would need litigation to be affirmed um, isn't justice. And it's not justice in particular for vulnerable communities that are going to feel it most in the ACT. Um, and, you know, I would 
echo what Helen said, it's, it's on the ACT government to follow through on that governing agreement and start looking at the right to a health environment being enshrined in ACT law, if not um, to go further and look at rights of nature, right to the highest sustainable standard of health, the other rights that go along with the right to a healthy environment. So um, basically that's where we stand, right? Um, there's this right to a healthy environment, this nebulous idea that we can kind of see matters in our daily lives. It matters that our water is clean. It matters that our air is breathable. It matters that our hospitals have proper ventilation with the air outside so that people that are really sick or ill are not having compounding respiratory issues um, when they're trying to get medical care. All of this stuff, you know, matters, but it, it's still a little bit nebulous you know, what, what difference would it make if it was recognised in ACT law? Uh, I think, unfortunately, in the environmental space, too often the law is a tool um, used to degrade the environment, used to sign off on major projects that are going to harm people. Um, and so I want to talk about two different ways that the right to a healthy environment could make a difference in the ACT in Australia if it was recognised as law. So the first way is that, you know, human rights have to be, um, all of your legislation, all of your government decisions have to be compatible with human rights. That's, you know, one of the basic premises um, of human rights legislation writ large, and it's in the Human Rights Act of the ACT. Um, and I'm sure Peter will go into it in detail about things like gas legislation and getting us off gas in a way that's equitable and that's going to uphold our human rights. Um, it's the same thing with making sure that we have appropriate amounts of funding for land care to ensure that the nature reserves that should be accessible to everyone actually are. But I also, and I also want to specifically flag that the right to a healthy environment strengthens um, Indigenous activism when it comes to legal challenges um, against major developments. Um, you know, there, there's currently um, a whole range of nations um, up in the Matawara or, or the Fitzroy in, in um, English river system who are fighting against mining developments and against um, cotton irrigation and other big developments on this pristine river system. And the right to a healthy environment, that human rights language, that substantive protection would really strengthen um, those ongoing, you know, fights against development approvals. But there's also a second way that the right to a healthy environment makes a real difference, and that's um, that it strengthens public interest litigation. And I'm, I'm sure Mel can also speak to this. Um, it forces our courts, our Australian courts, who are uh, pretty well known for skirting around the climate change issue as much as they can, um, to actually engage with the significant impacts of major developments, particularly fossil fuel developments. Um, and so I just want to go through a couple of cases and speculate what, what could the difference have been. So the first one I want to talk about is Sharma and Minister for the Environment, which was handed down this year, 2021. Um, it was that very big negligence case where children successfully argued in court, the federal minister for the environment has a duty of care to prevent climate harms, um, personal injury and death to children through the emission of greenhouse gases that come out of major developments. Now, this was a mammoth case. Um, and if anyone's got a free couple of evenings, you can go read all 160 pages. Um, and, and it's a very complicated case. I won't go into the details of the negligence law, but suffice to say, negligence is a legal framework that was developed a century and a bit ago. And it wasn't developed in the context of large scale environmental harm. So you've got um, a lot of challenges with applying negligence to climate change. And, but a duty of care was recognized and it was recognized um, based on the idea that the harms are catastrophic from climate change and we know they're linked to coal there's this really strong factual finding that coal greenhouse gas emissions lead to a two degree to four degree hotter world and this will cause harm um, so that was a very strong factual finding and there was also this very complicated legal finding that there is an implied mandatory consideration um, within the epbc act that um, we shouldn't be harming um, people basically, that the safety of people is an implied mandatory consideration. Um, and that took um, his honour about 40 pages to figure out. But if a right to a healthy environment was protected, 
um, and was a part of the law that his honor was considering in Sharma, that would have been, you know, A to B done. And it would have been a much stronger case. Um, and it's now currently being appealed. We'll see if it survives. Um, that would have been a much stronger case to have the right to a healthy environment. Um, the second one I'm going to go through very quickly, I know I'm on the buzzer, I'm very sorry, Kirsten, um, is the Hazelwood Power Station case that I'm sure many are aware of from 2004. It was a successful case, one of the first climate litigation cases in Australia that was successful, and it was a challenge to opening up a new coal field adjacent to the Hazelwood Power Station that would have allowed it to keep going for another couple of decades. Spoiler alert, it, it did keep going until 2017. Um, the case was successful. Um, but it was a judicial review case. And so basically um, ACF won, uh, but they won on the grounds that the minister, the decision maker did have to consider greenhouse gas emissions in making their decision. And so the case went back to the minister and the minister went, oh yes, I have considered greenhouse gas emissions. I still approve. And the, the Westfield coal mine was opened and it did contribute to Hazelwood Power Station continuing onwards. And, but you can imagine that a right to a healthy environment case on the same kind of thing on a power station and the massive health impacts it has, the massive climate change impacts it has, would have been potentially decided very differently because the judiciary would have had to engage with the fact that this development is going to have really significant adverse impacts. And so I think at the heart of why the right to a healthy environment matters so much to all of us on this call, engaging in the environmental advocacy space, is it brings home exactly how much the environment is connected to human well-being. And it brings home the fact that our legal system needs to engage with the substance of environmental conservation and safety in our environment, instead of just the procedure of, you know, everyone having a say, but the development still going ahead. That is at the heart of why this human right is so critical. Thank you, Annika. That was um, really fantastic. The, um, the comments in the chat uh, were roughly themed around um, future uh, generations um, being able to um, have that same uh, clean environment and um, uh, bushfire and wood smoke. Uh, so uh, clear air being uh, pretty critical um, to many people after our experiences in the last couple of years. I'd like now to uh, introduce Peter Bulling. Peter is an environmental scientist, activist, honours law student at the ANU. There's a bit of a theme there for the ANU and research advocate for green law, um, a colleague of um, Annika's. You may also recognise her as the Nature and Waterways campaigner for the Conservation Council, um, but tonight she's speaking from her green law perspective. Born and raised in Canberra, Peter believes in marrying the spheres of law and ecology to create effective environmental policy and law. Peter is a published researcher on the human right to a healthy environment and has worked in research, renewable energy advocacy and community led law reform. So Peter's going to um, expand now on um, perhaps some of the equitable impacts in meeting human rights objectives. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, before I get started, I would also just like to acknowledge that I am Zooming in this evening from the lands of the Noonawal and Ngambri peoples. I am very fortunate to live and work on their lands. I recognise all elders, past and present, and their continuing stewardship of the nature around me, from which I personally glean so much inspiration. I acknowledge any First Nations peoples joining us on the Zoom tonight, and I hope that everyone here feels comfortable to participate in this evening's discussion, particularly those of you with Indigenous heritage. Now, you've heard from the other speakers tonight on what human rights to a healthy environment will mean from a legal and a policy perspective. But as Annika touched on, research that we have recently conducted demonstrated that realising the right to a healthy environment presents governments with an opportunity or even a moral obligation to pursue social justice outcomes in conjunction. So in other words, the actions that governments such as the ACT government should take to realise the human right to a healthy environment, if implemented properly, they will have disproportionately positive <coughs> outcomes for vulnerable people in our community, 
but conversely, if implemented poorly, they will have disproportionately bad incomes for vulnerable members of our community. So, for example, a key action that the ACT government must consider in realising the human right to a healthy environment is accelerating the phase out of gas across the ACT. Now, as we know, natural gas, or more accurately described fossil gas, is extracted using hydraulic fracking with a severe environmental and social consequences for communities. The extraction of fossil gas releases significant amounts of methane, which is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide in the short term. Of course, when you then burn the gas for heating or cooking, even more greenhouse gases are leaked into the environment, including carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide and methane. Clearly, mitigating climate change and promoting the right to a healthy environment in taking those actions, the ACT needs to diminish its reliance on gas as quickly as possible. But what else does a life free from gas mean for Canberrans? Well, first, it means more affordable living. Affordability is a key tenet to the right to adequate living. We've all suffered through Canberra's freezing cold winters. In fact, it feels like a freezing cold winter today. I'm shivering up here. Um, and, you know, only to be rewarded with an enormous gas bill for attempting to save our toes from frostbite. Now, by phasing out gas and switching to electrified heating and cooling, not only will Canberra households be warm without harming the environment, but they will also save in upfront costs and bills. Now, everyone likes saving a buck on climate control, but for the most vulnerable people in our community, removing the hefty price tag of gas heating could be a deciding factor on whether or not they turn the heater on at all. After all, empowering people to control the climate of their homes and maintain it at a safe and comfortable temperature can also be interpreted as fundamental to the right to adequate living standards. Now, secondly, by accelerating the phase out of gas to support the human right to a healthy environment, we can all quite literally breathe a little bit easier. Not only is gas costly for Canberrans, but gas in the home has significant health impacts for members of our community. Research indicates that gas cooking alone contributes up to 12% to the burden of childhood asthma. This is the equivalent of a child being exposed to cigarette smoke daily. Gas cooking and heating also contributes to other respiratory problems, has impacts on the neuropsychological development of children, and increases the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning. Considering this, accelerating the phase out of gas is not only great news for every Canberran, but again, for those in the community who are a little bit more vulnerable, including those living with asthma or severe allergies, accelerating the phase out of gas could quite literally be supporting their right to life. Now, in contrast to the augmented benefits that vulnerable people can gain from the right to a healthy environment being properly manifested in the ACT, vulnerable people also stand to suffer augmented losses if decision makers do a botched job in implementing the right. Now, to continue with the example of phasing out gas, vulnerable people ought to have the opportunity to live gas-free and reap all the benefits that come with that, despite their ability to own property. This is especially important as vulnerable people stand to be disproportionately impacted by the health impacts associated with gas use due to the barriers to accessing health care. If Canberrans aren't properly supported in the transition away from gas, renters could be left behind or the financial burden of the transition could be passed onto their shoulders, shoulders that are already weighed down by considerable financial burden. Now, I recognize that my time is almost up and I've taken you all on a bit of a gas tangent, but to return to the main idea of what I'm trying to get across to you, the human right to a healthy environment must be considered through the eyes of equity in order to fulfill a true human rights agenda. Accelerating the phase out of gas is just one way that the ACT government should implement the human right to a healthy environment. Indeed, for the right to be completely established, holistic reform will have to take place as Annika discussed. Not only reform of our laws and our policies, but also of our lifestyles. Now I harbor a fear of change just as much as the next person, but I'm really not afraid of this next chapter in the territory story. We don't need to wake up tomorrow and transform the city but every choice that we make from here on in should be informed by the right to a healthy environment and made in the spirit of equality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, it's, it's almost like we coordinated it. Um, the uh, Conservation Council, as you probably may be aware already, um, ha has been long campaigning on gas phase out in the ACT. 
um, and we have a website called maketheswitch.org.au. So if you're interested in getting your house off gas or reading more about the environmental impacts and health impacts, I'll drop that um, web address in the uh, chat bar towards the end of the event. Um, it's a fantastic example of applying um, different lenses or different framing um, to uh, some of the environmental issues that we deal with and looking at it through a human rights lens or um, and, and understanding that those co-benefits really do exist. And, and if we consider issues from those different perspectives, we can advocate for them much more strongly and, um, and have outcomes that are going to better suit a larger proportion of the population. So now I'm turning to our final speaker, Melanie Montalban is currently the managing lawyer of the Environmental Defenders Office ACT practice, where she advises on a range of public interest environmental law matters, focusing on environmental human rights, climate change adaptation, and First Nations cultural heritage law. She's also clinical convenient of the ANU's Environmental Law Clinic. Melanie has previously worked in government, private practice, community legal centres, the United Nations, and as a refugee lawyer in Australia and the Asia Pacific region, which sparked her interest in climate displacement and climate change law. So Melanie is going to share her passion for environmental justice um, by going a bit more into the concept of human right to a healthy environment in international law and what other governments have done to realise the right. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the tra traditional custodians of the land on which I present from today, which are the Dharawal people in Western Sydney. Um, I'm actually visiting my parents who are joining me here live. <laughs> Uh, so I pay my respects to the Dharawal people's elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders attending the webinar today. Um, I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and that this was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I'd also like to give thanks to the um, Cons Council for organising this event and for the amazing speakers who've gone before me. Um, I think it'll, um, having me as the last speaker is actually quite a nice way of rounding out this discussion because Helen um, had outlined the ride at the, um, more broadly at the international level and what's happened previously in the ACT. Um, Annika and Peter have really brought it home to the ACT and now I'm bringing us back out internationally um, and thinking about the concept more broadly. So um, what I wanted to do was um, to begin with, talk about the link between um, human rights and the environment, which has been touched on today, but um, I'm focusing on biodiversity um, and human rights. And I just wanted to read from this beautiful report written by the current um, human rights um, rapporteur on human rights and the environment, um, David Boyd, um, on human rights, depending on a healthy biosphere or nature. So he says, all human rights ultimately depend on a healthy biosphere. Without healthy functioning ecosystems, which depend on health, on a healthy, on, sorry, unhealthy biodiversity, there would be no clean air to breathe, safe water to drink, or nutritious food to eat. Plants on land and in water produce oxygen through photosynthesis, photosynthesis which we breathe. A teaspoon of healthy soil contains billions of microorganisms um, that process organic matter into rich, dark, to feed plants and help to protect them from pests and pathogens. Healthy ecosystems also regulate the Earth's climate, filter air and water, recycle nutrients and mitigate the impact of natural diseases, or oh, sorry, natural disasters. Wetlands remove pollutants, shield coastlines, store carbon, absorb water and contribute to the food supply. Marine and terrestrial ecosystems absorb 60% of the carbon dioxide emissions produced by humans, slowing the pace of climate change. Healthy ecosystems also provide a renewable supply to timber, fibre, food, fish and other goods. Insects, bats and birds pollinate more than 75% of crops, including fruits, vegetables, almonds, cocoa and most importantly, coffee. More than 1 billion person or people depend on forests for their livelihoods. Billions of others rely on natural medicines for their health care, 
More than half of prescription drugs and 70% of cancer fighting drugs are natural or derived from nature. Spending time in nature also provides people with physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual benefits. So once you understand nature's immense and irreplaceable contribution to humanity, you see our intimate connection with the environment and, and in particular our need for a healthy environment. Um, to translate that into human rights language, um, what's at stake here, um, as mentioned by Helen and Peter and Annika, uh, our rights to life, um, or, and including a healthy environment, physical and mental health, food, safe drinking, water um, and sanitation, housing, culture and development. All of these things require a minimum environmental quality as a necess necessary precondition for their enjoyment. Um, I should note, however, that um, what that minimum standard is hasn't actually been defined at the international level and um, it is really open to interpretation and as has been discussed, it's quite nebulous. But I have been reliably told that the, those substantive elements were, were purposely taken out of the Human Rights Council's resolution so that states can interpret that to the um, broadest, highest level. So um, what is the right to a healthy environment? It has been touched on by all the speakers today, but the way that I've um, been taught it and understand it is that it really um, is broken down into three aspects or three elements and that, um, that are, those are the substantive rights, procedural rights and the rights of the most vulnerable. But if I could actually maybe just take a step back Something that Helen mentioned was that human rights are indivisible, interdependent, and interrelated, and you really have to um, accept that as um, uh, have that as a baseline understanding of human rights to understand what the human rights to a healthy environment is, because it touches on all these other human rights. So, when you think about the substantive rights aspect of it, it includes not only the right to a healthy environment itself, but all the other rights that I've just described. Um, the procedural rights are the rights to information, participation in decision making and access to justice and effective um, remedies. And then the third element is the prohib pro <laughs> prohibition on discrimination and the rights of the most vulnerable, which um, most vulnerable to environmental harm, which will include Indigenous um, peoples and local communities, women, children, um, people with disabilities, and other marginalised groups. Um, and this, this latter, the, the third element, the prohibition on discrimination and the rights of the, most, rights of the most vulnerable to environmental harm is so important to environmental and climate justice. Um, uh, particularly when you think about those groups are um, they're going to be the most impacted by environmental harm, um, but they're also the least responsible for it. Um, and uh, at the Environmental Defenders Office, and in particular my program, the Healthy Environment and Justice Program, our mission really is to combat environmental and justice issues. So the right to a healthy environment is very important to the EDO and the work that um, we do. Um, as I mentioned, the the substantive elements, um, the substantive substantive elements from an environmental um, perspective have, have been um, some of them have been identified by the special rapporteur to give you an indication of what a healthy environment looks like or um, uh, what you should expect or what you're entitled to. So that's clean air, a safe climate, healthy and sustainable sustainably produced food access to safe water and adequate sanitation, non-toxic environments and healthy ecosystems and biodiversity. Um, but as I said, the Human Rights Council's resolution didn't actually use that language because they wanted to keep what the right to a healthy environment is more broad. So um, my next question is why recognise it? And I think um, all the speakers have sort of touched on why you'd want to. Um, I think just very briefly, um, what it does is raises awareness of human rights issues that relate to the environment, which I think is very important. Again, drawing that link between the two. Um, 
it crystallizes and integrates both norms and they can develop together so we can have some consistency. Um, it really brings greater attention to the most vulnerable groups, which I said is very important for environmental justice. Um, and there's all these positive experiences at a national level um, where it raises the profile of an importance of environmental protection. It um, is the basis to enact stronger environmental laws. Um, it empowers individuals and the communities to advocate um, and to secure environmental protection. And there is evidence to um, demonstrate that it contributes to um, positive environmental outcomes where it is legislated. So I think that's enough reason to recognise it. But on another level, we actually just need it. There's so many issues, so many environmental issues in Australia like um, that could benefit from having the right to a healthy environment there to protect or to avoid um, all the environmental issues in Australia, which I won't go into. Um, Turning to what its legal status is internationally, so um, this, people have raised that there's been this recent resolution of the Human Rights Council, which occurred in October this year. Um, Human Rights Council is, uh, I don't know if anyone knows, but they're this intergovernmental body. Um, as Helen mentioned, they've got 47 um, members who are voted in. Their resolutions are political expressions of um, those council members or the majority of them. And so um, that resolution is um, non-binding, but what it, the value is that it has this normative influence, um, which I might try and discuss later if I have time. Um, but the Human Rights Council, as part of that resolution, has invited the General Assembly to consider the resolution. Um, that's a whole other process. Um, I don't have time to talk about it now, but there are views or there's people are optimistic that it will actually be adopted or endorsed. Um, uh, by the UN General Assembly next year. If people are interested in that, you can ask me a question during the Q&A. Um, what will I go to next? So, um, oh, and, it'll, and at the General Assembly, um, Australia will be voting on whether or not they recognise the right to a healthy environment, and that will be interesting to see which way they go. So what is the status in Australia? I think as um, well, I think as everyone said, it isn't legislated here, we don't have it, um, but there's elements of it here. So in a lot of environmental laws, we have that second element I spoke about, the um, procedural rights. So in a lot of environmental laws, we can um, request environmental information, we can participate in decision making sometimes, we can put in submissions during public consultation periods, um, and sometimes we can um, seek merits in judicial review, but um, it's patchy, ad hoc, piecemeal, and um, we really need to have it as its standalone right. Um, I should just mention, though, that the link between environmental harm and human health is already recognised in some environmental laws. If you're um, familiar with the Environmental Protection Act, at least here in the ACT, and I also know in Victoria, um, the environmental protection authorities, um, one of their administrative functions is to um, prevent environmental degradation and um, risk of harm to human health. So I think intellectually, like there's not a big jump to move from that. We already know that there is this link in environmental law, um, but we should expand um, how we view its um, impact on humans, not just in relation to health, but the broader impacts. So yeah, there's, there's bits of it, but it's not entirely there. Um, the last thing I just wanted to talk about was just opportunities um, and in particular legislative options because Annika and Peter have talked about um, uh, some more concrete examples and I'm just again just thinking about the law but um, and looking at the ways that it's been recognised by other countries so potentially a regional agreement but actually that's not an option because the closest one is the ASEAN Charter that's only open to Southeast Asian countries. Um, constitutional reform, this would provide us with the strongest protection, but let's be honest, that's unlikely. I should just say that I think there's real lack of leadership at the Commonwealth level um, in relation to environmental protection. There's a real trend that you devolve this environmental protection responsibility to state and territories. Um, we could have a national charter of rights. Um, I think that's it's been tried. It's an ongoing conversation. It would be great if we had one. Um, you could 
you could legislate it in subnational human rights legislation, which I'm so glad the ACT government is considering, um, and I would really um, encourage them to do that. Uh, you could legislate it in federal or state or territory environmental legislation, and then state or territory constitutions. Um, and there's this other option of reading it in, which um, Helen spoke about the, the, the greening of human rights, and Annika spoke about um, in the Human Rights Act, there's a provision, oh, Oh, sorry, with the human, in relation to the right to life, um, you could probably, you could interpret it perhaps as to include the right to a healthy environment. Um, but there's also the scrutiny of Commonwealth and state and territory bills as well. So I know at some point, I think there was um, uh, a um, proposed amendments to standing provisions under the EPBC Act. And in the process of that scrutiny of the that Commonwealth, oh, sorry, of that amendment as part of that dialogue process, there were questions put to, I think, yeah, whoever the Minister for Environment was about how that would impact the right to a healthy environment. Um, and the other way of maybe reading it in is through case law, um, uh, which the, the, arguably you could in the ACT under the Human Rights Act with that provision that says um, you can have regard to international law to interpret the provisions of the Human Rights Act. So those are all the options. Um, I think the easiest one, um, at least in the ACT, is the Human Rights Act, and that's what um, I'd be advocating for. But there's also, given that, that there are all those other elements like procedural rights and um, the rights of the most vulnerable, there would actually be a, quite a bit of work that would be need to be done to the Human Rights Act to really have, um, to be able to fulfill the human, uh, human right to a healthy environment. So that's me. I'm pretty sure I went over time, sorry, but thanks. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Melanie. Um, some really great um, legal avenues there, your know, options for, um, for advocates to, to work at getting um, these rights into legislation. And um, I think the, as you say, the constitution might be a bit of a stretch. It would be good to see constitutional rights enshrined, but um, yeah, we know uh, we don't have a great history in this country of reforming our constitution. Um, I'd like to invite our audience to um, pop a question into the chat bar if you have something that you would like to ask the panel. Um, excuse me, my phone. Apologies for that. Um, so I'm going to uh, direct the first question straight back to you, Melody. Um, you started out by talking about um, the importance of different ecosystems um, and the services that they provide um, to humans um, in terms of food provision, protection from storms and so forth. Does a hu the human right to a healthy environment protect ecosystems? Or could such legislation potentially compromise the integrity of natural ecosystems, particularly if those ecosystems are not directly adjacent to human settlements or the connection with um, a, a human health is not um, direct and apparent? Yeah, that's a great question. And it was actually one of, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking about these um, some broader questions which I mentioned before we started um, and one of them is that there's this parallel discussion about um, uh, there's this paradigm shift happening in environmental law of moving from an anthropocentric approach to um, environmental law to an ecocentric one which is nature centered nature focused um, and so can can it protect ecosystems away from humans? Depends on um, actually, uh, there are, I think there are um, examples of where it has actually been um, uh, protected um, independent of humans. So the Ecuadorian constitution actually has the right to a healthy environment um, in its constitution, but um, it it's more broader in that it actually um, also protects the right of mother earth or uh, I can't remember the, the wording um, but so that's actually more broad so it, it might be how you frame it as well because um, 
there's very iterations, many iterations of how it's been legislated. Um, oh, but actually, I did I've actually recall there's a case, a couple of cases that have come out of the Inter-American Court, Inter -American Court of Human Rights that have recognised the right to a healthy environment um, in relation to humans, but also um, as an autonomous right. So the so nature itself um, is protected. So in so. so that's a very loyally complicated way of answering your question. But um, yes, potentially in some circumstances. Um, and it would potentially depend on the legislation, your legal system. Um, and in Latin America, there's um, a real big move to have a ecocentric approach to environmental issues. So there, yes, here, maybe not. And I think that, um, that uh, addresses Tara's question as well, who was yeah. also interested in whether um, animals' rights um, were um, have been defended um, independent. Um, Could I yeah. also just chime in on that point? Yeah, please do. Quickly? Yeah, so this sort of anthropocentric view of environmentalism and environmental mo movements, I can understand why people um, feel quite uncomfortable with it. I feel really uncomfortable with it, and it's taken a lot of mulling these ideas over in my own mind um, to sort of come to some sort of resolution because, you know, the human right to a healthy environment um, is, you know, undeniably very, very important. But conversely, um, is it okay to take that argument? Are you then just suggesting that the only value of the environment is what it can serve to people? Um, so the sort of resolution that I have come up to, and it's not completely there in my own mind yet, I think I still lie awake at night thinking about this, is that in the current situation that we're in, we're in a crisis and we need to do everything we can right now to change things as quickly as possible. And if the you know anthropocentric argument appeals to more people, if it appeals to more decision makers, then you know just take it. Let's just take it and then eventually we can start coming back to having these conversations. But right now we just need action as quickly as possible. Annika, would you like to, to say anything further about that one? Yeah, thank you um, so much, Kirsten. I think both Mel and Peter have raised some really good points about um, anthropocentrism, but I also think, and um, I'm speaking from a white perspective very openly here, I'm not an Indigenous person, but I think we have a lot to learn from Indigenous elders and custodians um, about whether anthropocentrism is even... Um, necessarily an irreconceivable paradigm with ecocentrism. Humans are not disconnected from the environment where human society is not actually outside of the ecosystem. Um, if you look around your urban environment right now, you will see some pigeons and you will see some trees and those are all ecosystems. Those are all living, breathing things. We are living, breathing things. Um, and so I think when we talk about rights of nature, um, in relation to the right to a healthy environment. I think they are discussions that will come with different steps. I think it's easier when you're introducing someone to the idea of rights-based discussions around the environment to first say, you know, the, a healthy environment matters because you breathe clean air, like to, to put it in the terms that they understand. Um, but I think we can then move past that you know, and, and move into a discussion on rights to a healthy environment from the perspective of a human and rights to a healthy environment from the perspective of a fish or a crab or from a rock. Um, and, and I'd really encourage everyone in the audience, um, you know, there's um, in particular one of the articles that really influenced my understanding of this space is um, an article called Recognising the Matawara's First Law Right to Life, um, which had significant input from um, Nikina Wara scholar, Dr. Ampolina, which I'm sure many people have heard of. Um, and also from Nikina, um, traditional custodians um, of the Matawara Fitzroy River system. Um, and the first author of that article was actually the Matawara itself. Um, the Matawara spoke through the article and through custodians. And um, the, the central finding of that article, it was actually about native title, um, but the central finding was that in First Nations law, the right to life for the river system is the same right to life that any human being has. They are, you know, the same kind of compatible rights. Um, and they're compatible because human beings also have responsibilities to the environment. Sorry that I look like I'm in a 
like bushfire situation here. It's just very orange. Um, you know, I'm bringing the theatre into my um, answer. But um, it's a really powerful point that the right to a healthy environment is completely compat compatible with rights of nature. And, and I think it's, it's a really um, solid question, Tara, about, you know, in our current system, is just recognising the right to life going to end up, um, you know, uh, hurting non human right the, you know the rights of non-humans but I think we can have this discussion in a way that moves us to new value systems that we all are working in a much more integrated way. Thanks very much Annika and Melanie and Peter on, on that um, very complex relationship. Um, Helen I'd like to direct a question to you. Does the ACT Human Rights Commission work with the Com Office of the Commissioner for Sustainability and Environment on these, these issues? And, and where is the, the intersection and the opportunities for collaboration? Uh, there have been a couple of collaborations with the Commissioner for the Environment, mainly in relation to young people. And that's been done by the Children's Commissioner. I mean, I have uh, regular meetings with her, but we're really waiting for government timetable on considering the right to a healthy environment and that would be a really good joint project because I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about. Um, one area of interest for us are things like scar trees and uh, making sure that Aboriginal cultural rights are respected and I'm sure you've all read Bruce Pascoe's Dark Emu and um, you know <laughs> it's a two-way process of the land owning people as well people owning the land it's that, that's why they're traditional custodians and I think there's a really rich heritage there that um, we need to protect before it's lost forever and as I said earlier in relation to Torres Strait Islanders um, you know those lands could be lost for good with rising tides and you know there are neighbours um, uh, Kiribati other Pacific Islands it's not just Torres Strait Islanders attached geopolitically uh, to Australia thank you Thanks very much, Helen. Um, got a question from Dave, um, and this one might be a little bit specific um, for our panel, but um, let's have a go at it. The gin and dairy development, um, which is out near the Murrumbidgee in the northwest of Canberra, um, and it crosses the border into New South Wales, it's going to house about 30,000 people. Research by experts on dynamic fire propagation has shown that the ember risk in the area is extremely high, being at, um, out, out west and adjacent to some very open area um, and the mountains beyond that. This research has been more or less ignored, um, Dave's words, not mine, by both developers and those responsible for approving the development. Could there be a potential for a test case about duty of care and the right to a safe living environment for future and current residents relating to this development? I might, I might jump in very quickly. Um, I, I think I don't know much about this development, I will say, um, and I'm also... Not that anyone on the panel is giving strict legal advice tonight, but I'm just going to emphasise that this isn't legal advice. Um, you know, it, it could definitely, I think... There are, um, we're going to have to look at avenues for test cases for the right to a healthy environment eventually. But I would say that when it comes to planning, um, you know, project projects and looking at environmental risks um, and whether a developer or the approver um, didn't properly consider the risks, negligence law actually has us covered there. Um, Alec Finlayson and Armadale City Council is a 1994 case that has similar facts, actually. It was about the contamination of land um, from a timber plantation and then the housing development that went over the top and whether that environmental harm um, was something that should have been foreseen and, and whether the council was liable. The council was ultimately liable and, and lots of damages were handed out. So there are legal avenues um, that are outside of a, a test case kind of scenario where something about you know elevated bushfire risks as we go into a more climate, um, a, a warmer world. Um, there we do have mechanisms in the law that already exist, and I think that touches on a, an, an important part of the law, is that 
yes, we need to develop the law in new ways when it comes to the right to a healthy environment, when it comes to rights of nature. But um, when it comes to protecting people from, you know, harms that are right in our face, things like bushfire disasters, things like contaminated land, um, our laws can protect us. They just need to be enforced. Um, and that's where, you know, people like Mel at the EDO make such a massive difference in um, giving people accessible legal advice to engage in this stuff. Um, our, our laws are not silent on environmental harms. Um, they're not loud enough, but there are certainly already avenues there. Thanks, Annika. Would anyone else like to jump in on the topic of um, bushfires, smoke, um, and, and other environmental risks from climate change? Could I just um, uh, add that in relation to planning decisions, that um, planning authorities are public authorities under the ACT Human Rights Act, so all their decisions and actions need to be human rights compatible and they need to take human rights into account. So that's an area of challenge um, that advocates could um, argue. doesn't mean that they'll make the same decision or a different decision, but it's certainly worth making sure it's taken into account because it could change the decision. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It's um yeah, balancing um, the rights of, a, of individual species and ecosystems with human rights um, is clearly really, really complex. Um, and uh, the more we can um, consider those different framings um, in, in planning and legislation, the, um, the better our outcomes are going to be. Um, we do appear to have sort of come to the end of questions. If anybody has um, a question or if the speakers would like to make any last comments, please jump in now. I think we're, um, I think we're uh, well and truly overloaded with uh, how um, interesting this topic has been. There's uh, been an enormous amount of um, complexity and food for thought there. So uh, I think we'll wrap up a few minutes early. Um, we would like to thank very much uh, the Commissioner for Human Rights, Helen Watchers, for joining us this evening, Peter Bulling and Annika Reynolds from, the, uh, from Green Law and Melanie Montalban from the EDO. Thank you so much for contributing your expertise to hopefully what will be an ongoing discussion, particularly seeing as how we know that it is in the parliamentary and governing agreement, we expect to see more discussion uh, in this space in the next year or two. We know that the um, members of the Legislative Assembly are hoping to turn their attention to it uh, once we've got this COVID pandemic well and truly under wraps. Um, so thank you all for coming along this evening. The recording will be available online uh, within the next couple of days. Um, and just uh, to wrap up the discussion, I'm dropping a couple of links in the chat bar there now. Uh, the uh, next environment exchange event will be on um, food and organic waste. The ACT government is going to be uh, starting a trial of FOGO collection next Monday. Uh, so we're going to have some speakers, uh, one from the ACT government, one from the Albury uh, Wodonga City Council who have already been doing this collection um, and a couple of other local um, FOGO business operators. We uh, would love you to join us for that. The registration will be available online also um, in the next couple of days. Um, we're also launching our Christmas auction online. Uh, so if it, this is a great opportunity to, to get started on your Christmas shopping whilst also some supporting environmental advocacy. There are some really fantastic products, including um, a solar panel kit, um, steel clothes pegs, there's clothing, there's books. Um, there's also experiences including um, a, I think it's a breakfast chat 
featuring baked goods from Three Mills Bakery and um, an outing with, um, I think it's Shane Rattenby, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, um, and uh, some really great ideas in there. So please jump on the Gala Bids website um, and have a look there. Um, finally, we always welcome volunteers uh, across, across a wide variety of roles at the Conservation Council. So please um, visit our website, follow the links to get involved um, and tell us what you're interested in, what sort of, what sort of activities you'd like to, to contribute. We'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, and thank you once again to our speakers. Uh, it's, um, it's always wonderful to have such uh, depth of expertise and thank you everyone to turning up. Thanks for having us, Kirsten. Thanks, Kirsten. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Good night. Thank you everyone. Have a lovely evening. Bye. Bye.